There you go. Okay, that looks good. Okay, uh, Derek, I've been told your uh, last name is uh, C in France, but I don't, I don't trust myself, so why don't you go ahead and pronounce it officially so we get it right? Yes, Derek C in France. Perfect, okay. We have so much time. Yeah. I, I get a sense I could talk to you all day. <laughs> You've got all these ideas popping up. But let's talk thematically. The thrust of the film is clearly about fathers and sons. You've got two main male characters uh, in the movie. Uh, that are ab about the same age, and at some point, although they lead very different lives, they come together. Then there's another generation. Your, that, it, your movie is one of the rare movies that actually has those, you know, it's not six months later or the following spring, it's 15 years later. So you really do a generational jump, which I think is fascinating. It complicates the, the storyline brilliantly. I mean, I think it really does a nice job. But let's first talk about the two characters' relationships with their own fathers. Ryan Gosling... When we first see him, oh, in fact, before we get into the theme, I want to ask about that opening. That is a stunner of an opening. That close-up, tattooed torso with uh, that turns out to be Ryan Gosling. You don't know it, the a chance it's so tight. And him flicking the knife, and you can't tell if that knife is a, it's meant to be menacing or if he's somehow meditating or what he's doing. Ta can you just talk about what was the the point or the impact intended for that opening scene? Because it's a it's a it, it's a walloping great opening. Yeah, well, the, you know, this, this, the, the canvas of the film is so large, and I, I figured, I felt that we needed to uh, give it an opening shot that was substantial enough to, uh, you know, to, uh, to train the audience on how to watch the rest of the movie. I think the first five, ten minutes of any movie kind of sets the stage for how you watch it. Yes, and brilliant. So, so Pines, we wanted to do an unbroken uh, long take to open the movie, and this is about five or so minutes of yeah. It starts out with Ryan in his trailer with his you know put it you know with his knife you know. Uh, then he goes out and through a carnival, has to go into a circus tent where he mounts a motorcycle and goes into this globe of death where he rides with three motorcycles in, yeah, uh, like a, steel cage. in a steel cage. Yeah, and they, they ride upside down and. You know, at the very, uh, my, my DP, Sean Bobbitt, who is a ex-war photographer, he wanted to end the shot by going to the center of the cage. Uh -huh. Now, Sean is, you know, he's not a small man. Uh, you know, he's, he has <laughs> some stature to him. Uh, and I said, well, Sean, you know, that if you go into the center of the cage, there's going to be three motorcycles around you, too. And he says, we must go to the center. So I said, okay, uh, you know, get get armored up. So he looked like RoboCop. He had, a, he had like, with a camera. He had a, a yeah. motorcycle helmet, all this stuff. So we did this beautiful opening take, you know. It went through all, went through all the, you know, the trailer, through the carnival, into the circus tent. The crowd was cheering. I, I was hiding behind uh, the bleachers, and I was watching on my monitor, and I see, you know, I see the motorcycle go into the cage. Sean gets in the cage with them the, the steel door closes I see motorcycles revving on the you know uh, you know you know revving on the throttle I guess and uh, um, and I see the motorcycle start spinning around this ca our camera and it's beautiful this abstract image in the middle of madness and then all of a sudden my monitor uh, blanked out and I heard a gasp from the audience and I looked up and there was a Sean, my DP, on the on the bottom of a pile of three motorcycles. Oh my god! So we pulled the motorcycles off of him. He was in a bad mood because he wasn't hurt. He was yeah. just mad at himself for not getting it. And I said, Sean, okay, let's do it one more time. Thank God you're okay. Just stay outside the cage this time. And he says, No, we must go to the center. Wow. I said, You're gonna kill yourself. We did it again. The same exact thing happened. I was behind the I was behind the bleachers. And my monitor went static. Looked up. Sean was on the, you know, a motorcycle had stalled in midair and fallen on the, on top of him. Well, you know, when we pulled him off this time, he had a concussion. He had to go to the hospital. Oh we had, to, you know, and uh, you know, the next day we did the scene again. I would not allow him to get inside the cage, and he still won't talk to me. <laughs> really? Yeah. Well, it's a hell of a, <laughs> an opening, <laughs> and I love this idea that the opening five or ten minutes of a movie teaches you how to watch the movie. Yeah. How? how can you explain to somebody who hasn't seen the film yet how you are teaching us to watch The Place Beyond the Pines, A Place Beyond the Pines? Well, uh, you you have to watch it. You, it's okay. not it's not it's not it's Fair not enough. it's you have to engage with yeah. it. It's not uh, it's not there to just uh, to just manipulate every emotion from yeah. you. It's a, you know, I like movies that are made with a respect for the audience where yes. the audience can watch it and actually have a have a participation in what's happening on the screen. Yeah. You know, uh, there's a visceral, visceral quality to it. There's also, uh, uh, you know, a cerebral quality. You have yep. to think about it. So it's you're working. It's working in your body. It's working in your heart, and it's working in your mind. And you actually have to, 
you know, you have to watch. Yeah. You have to watch and you have to listen and you have to look and you have to think and you have to feel. Yeah. And so that's what it that's 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 what I want people to do. I want to set the audience up to 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 experience. That's great because there are there are so many visual uh, um sort of repetitions that you know come up. Oh yeah, oh that oh I see what he's doing here. This is how he's I mean you've got a very similar to the opening scene with Bradley Cooper when he returns to work. You know, you yeah. do it over the shoulder and he comes up. There are all these things that if you're alert to what's happening in the movie, everything becomes this a, 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 their metaphoric possibilities are endless, and I and I love that about how rich your movies seem to be. Now I'm afraid just because we're running yeah. out of time, we got to let's talk about the th the theme that I introduced earlier. It's about fathers and sons. Let's just take the, the uh, initial character, uh, Ryan Gosling. He there's a reference in the movie at one point where he says, "My dad wasn't around much, and look at how I turned out. I want to be around." He finds out that he has a son that he didn't realize he had. I want to be around. Uh, around him, unlike my dad, you know. So mm -hmm. somehow his idea that that his dad not being around made him turn out to be the way he did seems to be a reflection on him. he's not happy with himself. Talk to talk to me a bit, bit about the the father son relations with the Ryan Gosling character. Uh, well, yeah, the, the movie is it's all about legacy and yeah, um, legacy. And uh, you know, I wrote it when my wife was pregnant with my second son. The idea came to me as I was thinking about everything I was going to pass on to him huh. and kind of my uh, desire for him to be born clean without any of my baggage, without any of my sins, without any of my, huh. uh, I don't want to taint him, you know? So there's this moment yeah. in the movie early on when Ryan, covered with tattoos, this guy who's seen and done everything mm -hmm. and had everything happen to him, uh, sees his baby for the first time and he holds this baby and he has to wipe his hands off before he holds the baby. and. Uh, and and you have this guy covered in tattoos and a baby who's just clean. And to me, that's the that that's the whole idea of the movie is what what we pass on and what we're born with, the choices and decisions. So you know, with Ryan's character, Luke, he's you know he he never had if he never had a father. Mm -hmm. And I know a lot of people. I've met a lot of people who are great fathers or are really trying to be great fathers, and they didn't have fathers mm -hmm. growing up. I mm -hmm. personally myself, I had a very uh, I had a great dad, you know, supported me, you know, coached my basketball team, was mm. always, always there for me. Um, uh, but I know a lot of people who had that opposite experience, and then they, you know, when they have children of their own, they don't ever want to see their kids go through that feeling. They don't yeah. ever want their kids to feel the way they, their dad made them feel. Yeah. And so that's what kind of Ryan is doing, and he kind of overcompensates a bit, you know, because he has no training. But again, he's a character who's trying to stop the cycle, you yeah. know what I mean? The cycle of pain, you know? And that, that's why I always liked about him, too. You know, that's why he came came with all those tattoos. Is, yeah. You know, the tattoos are a sign of his, that he's marked, you know what I mean? They're the scars. Mm -hmm. They're they they're the embodiment of his pain, you know? Uh. And, uh, and uh, yeah, and, you know, I don't think he wants his kids to get tattoos. Not yet, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in fact, one of the things, is it a distraction? I found myself... Uh, try, each time I, a new scene, I would see a different tattoo. Yeah. Do you think trying to figure out what the tattoos are, you know, you've got the, the, the knife with the blood, you've got the Bible, you've got the boxes, you've got yeah. the, uh, the snake. Do you, are, are, do you want to encourage viewers of the film to kind of, you know, read him like the illustrated man, or do you think that's a distraction from the all, main core of the movie? All of those tattoos are tattoos that Ryan says that he w wants to have, but that he can't have because he's an actor, but ah. every one of them means something yeah. uh, to, to him and to Luke and so I think it's great. I think I think yeah. the deeper a film is, and the more that people can continue to read into it, sure. uh, the better. My one of my favorite films is Contempt by Godard, and I've watched that film you know at least thirty times. And every time I watch it, it's it's the, there's just discoveries to yes. be made. So you know that's you know that's uh, to me that's my aspiration as a filmmaker is to make a film that you can watch more than one time. Yeah. Um, you know, in terms of the face tattoo, I'll just say one thing yeah. that Ryan was always saying he wanted a face tattoo for the film. And I kept telling him, well, that's pretty intense, you know, yeah. to get a face tattoo. That's a real commitment. And he says, no, it's going to be the coolest thing ever. <laughs> it's going to be a dagger and it's going to be dripping blood. And I said, okay, you want to do it? Fine. Go ahead. It's your choice. It's you. Yeah. You're, the, you're the guy. Go ahead. Get the tattoo. So, uh, you know, he got this face tattoo. We were shooting the first day. You know, of course, they're temporary tattoos. Sure. Shooting the first day at lunchtime, Ryan came up to me and he said, Hey, D, I think I made a mistake with the tattoo. He says, I think it's too much. Huh. I think I think we should get rid of it. 
And I said, see, I told you so. That's what happens when you get a face tattoo. You regret it. And now you're stuck with it. And now you're going to have to live with it for the rest of the movie. Uh, <laughs> and that, that informed this shame that this character wow. felt. You know what I mean? He has this marked on his face. Yeah. And he can never hide it and never get away from it. Um, and so I like I like getting into that place with actors where all of a sudden you're, you're they're not acting anymore but they're behaving mm -hmm. you know what I mean and as a as uh, you know as 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 the filmmakers were capturing their behavior yeah you know okay so now the the other main character Bradley Cooper yeah. he has a father a very a very available father but the, obviously there's some kind of friction <laughs> between that so when you've got an absent a guy who grew up without a father in effect. You know, sort of mourning that loss and wanting to make sure that doesn't happen. Here you have a father who's a bit overbearing. At least you get the sense that Bradley Cooper's character feels like that father is overbearing. He has a son, and very interestingly, at least when he's talking to the psychologist or psychiatrist after uh, some significant event in the movie, he actually talks about the kid as sort of like getting in the way. It's like, well, you know, I've got all these issues, and then I also have to deal with this baby, which the the psychologist picks up on right away. Can yeah. you talk a bit about the difference between? His relationship with his son versus uh, vis a vis uh, Ryan Gosling. Well, again, or his, or his own father. Yeah, again, Bradley Cooper Avery, he is trying to get out of the shadow that his father, out of the legacy that his father has left for him. You know, he's trying to become his own man. His father is, uh, you know, he's a very powerful judge in this in this city of Schenectady, and uh, Bradley, you know, wants to be his own man. He wants to, you know, he, he goes to law school, but he wants to kind of carve his own path, so he wants to see justice in his own way, so that's why he becomes a, a, a cop. And he's trying to prove himself, as, you know, and he's this character that that's always been kind of uh, uh, the leader, the guy that you look to as uh, the person who's going to make the right decisions. And he's making this great moral decision that he wants to just from the ground up uh, you know, do good and right. add to the world, and not just take uh, the opportunities that his father is going to give him. And then, of course, when he's a, this rookie cop, he makes this mistake, and this mistake creates this toxic shame in him that he can't deal with. And, uh, and instead of, and, but he's a good man. And instead of going inside and, and fixing everything that's kind of broken inside of him and and confronting this shame, he he goes outwardly and he tries to fix everything that's corrupt around him instead of the corruption that's inside of him. And his inability to speak with his or you know to connect with his son is all, you know, based of, uh, around that he can't connect with himself and he can't deal with this and I he can't deal with his own blood his own. What he, you know, what his own legacy. Uh, yeah. I've have have spoken with people, you know, cops or uh, uh, or soldiers who have, you know, you know, killed, you know, people in in the line of duty. Mm -hmm. And uh, one thing that always comes up, or a common theme that has came up in my research, is they have an incredible guilt or an incredible uh, inability to deal with their own families, you mm -hmm. know, afterwards. It's not, of course, mm -hmm. it's not a, all the way across the board. Sure. But you know, if you leave someone else fatherless, and yet you have a, uh, you're a father. It's hard to, yeah, father the the thing that you're the the person that you're supposed to be fathering when you've left someone else without yeah. that. And that I mean that literally comes up in the script. And I see Janet here. So the, my last question then about that next generation. Yeah. This idea of legacy, how they want to they want to like break the cycle, but also like create a new legacy. Is that is what we just saw happen to their father's generation going to happen now to them as they head off into their own world? I, I I'm not a cynical person, you know. I don't. I think the ending of Blue Valentine is hopeful, you know, because mm. uh, they they're breaking a cycle, you know. I think Michelle Williams' character in Blue Valentine to me is the hero huh. because she stops something uh, yeah. that was unhealthy from from continuing. Um, uh, of course, I also, you know, whatever. I, I love both of the, both of them. Uh, right. And in this movie, I, to me, it's it's about uh, evolution. You know, I was reading a lot of Jack London when I was writing this too, and I was huh. thinking a lot about the calling down of ancestors and and kind of Darwinism. You know, the kind of you know uh, survival of the fittest and just uh, you know, in order to survive, you have to be better mm -hmm. than your than ah. your parents. You know, and uh, I think that the kids in this movie, especially uh, Jason, who's uh, Gosling's kid, I think right. he is taking another step forward. Is it? I don't know how huge it is, but yeah. it's like the rings on a tree. Each one of them gets bigger. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's still the same circle, still the same yeah. cycle. It's, but it's, uh, it's evolving. 
Speaking of cycle, he's still on a cycle, a motorcycle, but he's heading west. He's like, yes. you know, heading on. So yeah. excellent. I get that. We can talk all afternoon. Yeah. Yeah. I, brilliant yeah. filmmaker. Yeah, yeah. Brilliant film. Oh, Good luck you. with the, with the movie.